Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this World Economic Forum discussion on the circular economy and how innovation can help us through this moment of an economic reset after uh, COVID-19. Now, I'm Stephen Carroll. First of all, I'm a journalist at France 24. I'm speaking to you today from Paris, and we're looking forward to hearing in this session from both the public and private sector about the innovation and what's going on in this space around the circular economy, learning to reduce and reuse waste from objects all around us is not only, of course, a major uh, issue in addressing the climate emergency, uh, but also a huge economic opportunity. It's estimated that the circular economy could create 700,000 net jobs and generate savings of $200 billion by 2040. And that's, of course, on top of the environmental benefits uh, that increasing use of the circular economy would bring to us. We'll be discussing uh, the opportunities here in this particular context of the COVID-19 pandemic and how uh, companies and governments can move towards greater uh, circularity in the economy. Uh, we'll be speaking to our panel in just a moment. There will be an opportunity for you to join us with your questions via the Zoom chat. We'll get to those a little bit later on. But first, to start off our discussion, we have a short video from the World Economic Forum, which will set us up for those key themes in this area around leadership, uh, value chain transformation, and of course, innovation. sets us up nicely for what we're going to be talking about uh, over the next half hour. Let's get to our panel. Um, panel stories from around the world today. We have from uh, Xiaomi uh, Show Z2, the president of international at Xiaomi. Xiaomi, of course, the world's third biggest smartphone maker. It'd be great to hear about what your company's doing in terms of e-waste, which we know is globally a really big problem in this area. Um, 50 million tons a year globally of e-waste. So we'll be interested to hear what Xiaomi is doing about that. From the Netherlands, we have Environment Minister Stientje van Veldhoven joining us. The Netherlands setting ambitious targets in this area, including to half the use of primary resources by 2030. So we're looking forward to hearing uh, from you about that. Turning next we, to Paris, we have Bertrand Camus, who's the chief executive of Suez. Uh, Suez is a major player in water and waste management around the world, supplying drinking water to over 90 million people. Uh, the company also has a big business in plastics recycling, so we'll be interested to hear uh, more about that and what innovation is coming towards in that area in particular. And from Nigeria, we have Bilikis Adabi Abiola, who's the uh, co-founder of WeCyclers, uh, which is a platform that allows people to get their recyclables picked up and then collect points for it, which they can later redeem for cash. So a great example of entrepreneurship in this area of the circular economy as well. Welcome to you all and thank you for being with us today. Um, let's go first to show Z2 uh, from Xiaomi uh, joining us today from Beijing. You're, of course, a huge player in the electronics area. This is an area where there is huge potential for circularity. Um, let's, let's start with the idea of, of how a company like yours in the electronics sector, how do you, how are you addressing the issue of e-waste and how can you set the scene for us in terms of innovation in this area? Okay, Th thank you very much, Stephen, and, and thank you very much to everybody for giving us the forum to speak today. 
just for some context setting, uh, Xiaomi, as Stephen mentioned just now, is the third largest smartphone maker in the world today and the leading uh, uh, consumer IoT company with about 250 million devices connected on our IoT platform already. Uh, we are operational in 90 countries around the world um, and uh, uh, significant in, in Western Europe in particular. Uh, for example, we're the largest smartphone company in Spain, the second largest in Italy, and the third largest in France today. So as, as a truly global company, you know, uh, we, we want to be a very good uh, local citizen in all the countries, in all the countries that we operate in. And we want to make sure that, you know, um, first of all, we are very focused and dedicated to to the push uh, to, to strengthen our circular uh, economy capabilities and also to be a better corporate citizen. So I think, you know, the first thing I would like to share is uh, this is not something that's sort of, uh, you know, being done as a, as a project within the company. It's actually set at the very top. Uh, at our last board meeting uh, sometime at the end of last year, we actually, uh, you know, we actually set a particular board resolution to make sure that we strengthen our CSR core capability. So, so this is something that we're taking uh, very seriously and all the way at the very top of the, of the company. Uh, in terms of you know, what we have done so far, I think the first thing I would like to say is, you, you know, as, a, as a company that's involved in the manufacturing space, uh, we won't be able to do this alone. Uh, so the first thing we have done since 2018 uh, has been to encourage uh, and push our core suppliers. There are about 200 of them. We, we do this via, you know, a, a few different ways, uh, via, you know, uh, increasing the, uh, the requirements that we, that we ask of them. And also, you know, in, in many, many forums that we, we organize with them, uh, we keep repeating that this is something that, this is a, this is a direction that we want to move towards. Um, in terms of the results, you know, there are a lot of points. I'm just going to pick a few. For example, you know, for our latest uh, flagship that we launched in Europe, uh, we've reduced plastic packaging by 60%. And this year, our target is to reduce by 80%. Uh, uh, in terms of, you know, we've introduced something called green packaging. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, the, the box that you get your device in, we, we, are, we are calling it the one paper box, which saves up to about 40% of packaging material. Um, in fact, you know, uh, just as a small fun uh, tidbit, you know, uh, when China was making this big push on garbage classification, uh, we even, uh, in, we even uh, implemented this little feature in our in our AI uh, voice UI, so that you can uh, you can more easily find out you know what kind of a uh, garbage classification sit, you know that your 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 the, the the garbage that you have should be sitting in. So that's uh, you know the direction that we're pushing in. Uh, the other area that we have worked very hard on is to increase after sales maintenance um, efficiency, in particular with the use of resources. There, uh, this is an area that you know because it's not at the always at the front line of the business. Uh, frequently, it doesn't get the it doesn't get the uh, attention of the top executives. And as a result, you know, that this is an area of a lot of wastage. So for every device that you buy, you know, there is, a, uh, there is a, usually a provision of a lot of replacement parts. Uh, so we have put in, you know, significant efforts to make sure that that kind of replacement parts are uh, used in a much more efficient way uh, so that we can reduce a lot of wastage over there. Uh, so, so these are just- sort of financial- so I'm sorry to, to interrupt you, but what sort of financial commitment does that involve from a company like yours to, to put these systems in place? Um, and, and what sort of leadership is necessary in that area to improve that? Uh, we believe that, you know, in the short term, there's going to uh, obviously be some costs associated in, in terms of building the systems to, for example, for the after sales efficiency uh, uh, measure, we have to put in some investments up front to upgrade our IT systems. But uh, the math works out so that such that in the long term, the efficiency gains are going to outweigh, you know, the, the upfront investments. So, so from this point of view, you know, we, we, we believe that uh, you know, we're not only helping the planet, this is actually good for our business. Uh, and of course, you know, our consumers are demanding this. So, so from a demand side, there's a strong push for us to, to invest more, uh, to be a better corporate citizen as well. And how important are, are government targets in this area? You know, it, can, can governments help you to do more or is this something that you feel the, the private sector can lead in as well? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, it, it, these decisions have to be an economic decision for, for private companies, as, for companies as well. Uh, but it really does help when, you know, the government is, is pushing in that, in that uh, direction. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, for this to be truly sustainable, it has to be something that's more organic on the part of uh, companies rather than, you know, depending on big subsidies to, to push. 
Okay, so um, Z2 from, from Xiaomi, thank you. Let's turn next to the Netherlands to Environment Minister uh, Stientje van Veldhoven. Uh, tell us what about what your government's doing in this area. You've set very ambitious targets. How are you moving towards, particularly in the context of, of COVID-19, how are you accelerating the move towards those targets? Well, we set uh, ambitious targets indeed. We want to halve our primary use of resources by 2030, and we want to be fully circular by 2050. And I think the first element uh, that was already mentioned here is circular economy is about much more than recycling. Uh, it is also about repair, it is about uh, designing, uh, it is about longer use, it's about avoiding waste. Um, and if you ask us how are we dealing in this context of, of COVID, uh, it only stresses the need to push further for this because waste is a cost and literally a waste of money. And now if we are thinking about how to rebuild our economy, we have an opportunity to build our economy in a circular way. We need to recognize the value of the resources that we are using, and we have to think about how to keep them in this chain for a longer period. So there's two elements which are really very important and which we work on in the Netherlands. That is cross-sectoral collaboration. As Chu just said, no one company can do this alone. Uh, but one company or one sector can have a great impact on the entire chain. If he says, I'm going to change my packaging, he will change uh, a, an entire supply chain. And so uh, those sectors that are changing are having a spillover effect on other sectors. And the second part is, I think, from the side of governments, we need to become much more aware of how crucial the circular economy is for combating climate change. And we should be uh, willing to, in our in our way to making the circular economy just the regular economy, I think that's what Xu also said, and I fully concur, there needs to be an economic reality, an economic logic in being circular, but we can influence that economic reality through subsidies in the beginning, but you want to go to a real, um, to, a, to a, let's say, a self-sustaining uh, economy, uh, and therefore also by giving the right price and by setting norms and regulation. And in the Netherlands, we are working on all of these issues across, across the entire government, uh, investing in uh, education, uh, investing in different uh, business models, uh, bringing partners together and setting norms and standards. And what has been the, the feedback from industry when you've been discussing with them setting these targets and also then meeting these targets? What sort of response have you got? Well, actually, we have um, uh, we've gotten very positive feedback because industry largely recognizes this as a very important strategic agenda. Uh, and what we've tried to do is to bring all of the front runners together because those who are already willing to step ahead because of their strategic insight are even more willing to push forward jointly with other partners that do the same. So we've set up a national plastic pact, reducing uh, the use of plastics, uh, increasing the use of secondary materials, et cetera, et cetera. We've enlarged this national plastic pact with France, for example, uh, and with Denmark and a lot of other European countries to a European plastic pact, thereby jointly creating a market for the industry to, to change for. There is a business opportunity because all of these governments are pushing in that same direction. And then when it comes to regulation, there we really need the cooperation with the European Union that is going to put forward uh, this year uh, a mandatory amount of uh, secondary materials in new plastic products. Uh, and of course, for business, if the same rules go for everybody, then uh, they do not object. Now, they're even our, our firm supporters in getting this, uh, this mandatory requirement off the ground, because then we have a level playing field, which is of strategic importance for all of those companies. Okay, I think I'm glad you touched on the issue of international cooperation on that as well, which I think is is very key to this uh, conversation. Let's go next to Bertrand Camus, who's the chief executive of Suez. Um, Bertrand, you have set big targets in terms of increasing investment and in research, 50% by 2023. What sort of impact will you have in terms of the, the circular economy with that sort of investment? 
Uh, what we see is, uh, is a complete uh, revolution of the way we uh, uh, will manage waste in the future and, and also water, uh, which are two core businesses. Uh, if we want to answer uh, the needs that have been very well set out uh, by, the, by the minister uh, and uh, achieve uh, a real impact in terms of uh, being able to, to recycle and, and reuse uh, uh, secondary uh, raw material. And therefore, this needs a solution, and this is what we are, uh, I would say that's our role, uh, to bring uh, solutions to, to, to help that happen. And it's all around innovation and partnering with, uh, with, 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 the, with the clients. Um, and just to give you a, a, an example to, to illustrate, when we look at, uh, at plastic waste management, uh, uh, I think that we have to work at the source uh, to uh, eliminate waste, definitely. Uh, this means working with uh, the users of, uh, of plastics, uh, as a container. Uh, and very interestingly, I will not name a large company that is delivering you uh, products at any time of the day uh, and night, uh, but they bring you more waste than product usually. Uh, they uh, have a CO2 footprint uh, that is uh, um, quite large because uh, they are answering your needs. So all of that uh, needs to be fixed. And at the end, it's about innovation. Uh, how can you help a customer to be more efficient in the way they reduce their, uh, their, their waste production and uh, also how can we facilitate their life uh, to, um, to, 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 source, to, to sort better the waste. Then we have to invest in uh, plastic recycling. If you have the opportunity to visit one day a uh, plastic recycling facility, as the one we just opened in, in, in Thailand, uh, it's full of uh, optical recognition, laser sorting and so on. It's very high tech. Uh, type of, uh, of technologies. And of course, as plastics are changing in terms of uh, um, um, uh, components thanks uh, to the to recycling, it impacts also the way we can then uh, recycle it uh, within the, the, the plant. And at the end, you need to have users, uh, usually large corporations, who are going to uh, use those plastics in their own processes. And this is more around the partnering. So you see that we have uh, a lot of movements at the same time on the various uh, steps of the, of the plastic waste chain. And all of that is requesting innovation and partnering with the various actors, being the customer or citizen, uh, the, 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 the specialist of, uh, of recycling and the users at the end, all of that in a framework of regulation and, and, and price incentives so that uh, at the end those businesses uh, can, make, uh, can make a living. And I could do exactly the same uh, type of uh, description of uh, what are the challenges with, uh, with water and wastewater reuse. We will have to better treat uh, the waste water so that we can protect uh, the, the environment. Uh, I have the Seine River behind me, if you cannot see it because of the fog. Uh, in summertime, uh, in 20 years' time, uh, it will be, uh, um, there will be half of the water in summertime. And therefore, if you don't treat better the wastewater, uh, you are going uh, uh, to damage the environment. And therefore, you, are, you need to treat it to a point that it can be reused. And all of that is creating uh, opportunities to uh, go more towards circular economy. But you, as a CEO, you also, of course, have to answer to, to shareholders. So I'm, I'm interested in how quickly do you feel there need to be results from this in, innovation for you to also be able to make the case to those other stakeholders? I think that uh, when you look at the, the, large, uh, the large corporations or even the large uh, municipalities we are dealing with, Today, we cannot be only a good uh, producer of drinking water or a good waste collector. We need to be a partner to accelerate their own transition. When you have large corporations like uh, Unilever, Procter, we are part of an alliance to end the, the plastic waste. They are all committed uh, with very uh, strict and stringent uh, targets in terms of uh, improving their, their, their environmental impact, uh, especially, for example, uh, incorporation of secondary raw material, uh, which is new. Huh? It was not the case a couple of years ago. And therefore, they need to have access to these products. Uh, and therefore, they are ready to partner and, and, and to share, uh, I would say, the, 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 not only the cost, but in the investment to, to make it happen. So I think that things are really changing, changing fast. And if a business like ours wants to be a, a leader as we are today in 10 years' time, we need to be able to bring the solutions that are not only going to uh, 
improve the reliability of those processes, but bring the cost down a little bit like what happened with renewable energies and also answer to the final client's uh, expectations because at the end, uh, by taxes uh, or by, uh, by, by, uh, by uh, purchase, uh, they are the ones at the end who are paying uh, the total cost of that and, uh, and being able to reduce it and, uh, and making it uh, uh, easy for them is one also of our, of our goals. And therefore, it's clearly something that uh, Is, uh, is part of our strategic plan and our investors who are more and more committed to ESG type of uh, uh, approach uh, and, and, and stock are, are definitely understanding the necessity to invest a lot in terms of innovation. Okay, Bertrand, thank you. Let's go now to Nigeria, to Bilicus Adabi Abiola um, from WeCyclers. Uh, you, are, you are our example of of your whole business as an innovation in this area of the circular economy. Tell us a bit about getting that started and the consumer response I'm interested to in, in, in to WeCyclers since you've set it up. Thank you. Um, so WeCyclers started eight years ago as a class project while I was a student at MIT Sloan. Um, I'm really focused on helping people that live at the base of the pyramid. People live um, earning less than $2 a day, earn value from their waste. Um, it's a social enterprise, and it's really it um, was created to work around um, the issues like the lack of infrastructure. So you see that in many cities in the developing world, um, we don't really have good um, navigable roads. Um, so it's really hard for trucks to go in and collect this waste. And so we built an innovative um, software-powered system that also worked with um, bicycles, low-cost cargo bicycles, um, to go around to. To, um, local communities and encourage them to sort their plastics, their papers, metals in exchange for points which they would redeem, um, you know, in ex for, for, for money. Um, and it's been eight years and we've been able to create 200 jobs. We've also built 10 franchise businesses um, and we've, we've been able to show that people can be engaged and be empowered in cleaning up um, their communities. Initially, it was really challenging to convince people to, um, because there was a really low awareness, low public awareness on why people need to recycle, why they need to dispose of their waste properly. Um, but over time, when people began to see, you know, that they could actually earn money from, you know, collecting this waste, they could empower themselves with waste. We saw that people, you know, really uh, warmed up to it. We've, we have stories of of mostly women. Um, we have a woman that, um, you know, before she started recycling with recyclers, she was earning about $10 to $15 every month. And after working with recyclers, she was able to earn, um, you know, about um, 10, 20 times that, you know, in a few months. So this, these are real stories of real people that can turn their lives around just by, um, you know, being engaged in recycling. Um, so we, 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 we've seen that there's so many challenges, you know, that we face um, as, a, as an innovative business. You know, it's a new business in a developing um, economy. And one of the big issues that we faced is funding. You know, it's difficult to raise money. Um, even philanthropic investors, social, social impact investors, they, are, they have a very high bar. So over, over time, we've had to, you know, bootstrap our way into building this business. So that's you know, one big issue that we have is funding, finding the funding. Another big issue is um, you know, absence of you know, clear policy environment where people will be mandated to recycle. So it wouldn't be just by choice. It wouldn't be recyclers having to go to each and every home to tell them what to do. It will be a concerted effort you know, pushed by the government to educate and mandate people to recycle. So I think if we can do that, that would be a really big um, solution, um, you know, to, to this problem. That's interesting because I think the issue of scale up is very, very kind of key to this discussion as well. Are, are those, as you see them, funding and, and regulation, are those the two things that will help scale up in this area? Those are just two of many. I think another big one is for the, co the companies that make this packaging to be more thoughtful, to be more, fo you know, to be more um, thoughtful about what kind of packaging they are pumping out into the world. You know, at WeCyclers, we collect all kinds of packaging and there are some packaging that we collect that cannot be recycled. Um, so there are many companies now going for, you know, 
because of cost, because they're trying to penetrate this market. There's, um, um, you know, people that have lower disposable income. They have to, you know, they, so they have to put more thought into the kind of packaging that they are producing. They have to think about how is this packaging going to be collected? So their responsibility should not end at the supermarket shelf. It should be a circular chain where they will be responsible for ensuring that the waste that they send out is brought back. Because this waste, even if they don't realize it, is a problem for everyone. The, the um, coronavirus pandemic has shown us that the world is connected. So even if, um, you know, Lagos, for instance, is one of the top 10 polluters of the ocean, so if you don't um, try to solve this problem, it's going to be everybody's problem. Okay, Bilikas, thank you. Let's go to some of the great questions we've been getting from the, our audience today. Um, Minister von Beethoven, I, I'd like to ask you one of the uh, questions that have come in about how to generate global standards of processes in the area of, of the circular economy and how to promote more listed companies into adopting that model. Um, what do you think is the key steps that need to be taken in that, in that area? Well, the key step is to come together and join forces. Uh, and there is a great, great platform, the platform for the acceleration of the circular economy, PACE, uh, that is working already with over 100 organizations across sectors uh, to build four action agendas uh, in the areas of plastics, electronics, textiles and food. Uh, we'll be launching those action agendas next week. Um, and I think they, they highlight the key elements that we all need to work on and how we can collaborate on this to make this transition a reality. If we join forces, we can not only go further, but we can also go faster. And if you look at the challenge that we have, going faster is one of, should be one of our goals. So uh, for all those companies that are looking for ways to how to make that change, how to get to those standards, join forces, for example, within the PACE action agendas, uh, and let's make sure that we don't wait for the world governments to set all of our standards, but let's join forces between those governments that are willing to push forward, but also between, between companies that are willing to make that change, that see that strategic agenda, and let's, let's jointly make sure that we make it easier by combining our forces uh, and aligning our efforts. Thank you. Um, Show a question I, I'm going to put to you. It was a question to all of the panel, but this idea of carbon transparency. Uh, do you have any plans to introduce carbon transparency for goods? Is that something that you would see that would be workable, to, for example, through the, the example given by our questioner, is through a digital product passport to help encourage the circular economy? Is that something that you think that could be done? I think it's a very interesting idea. And uh, it definitely, we, 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 by the way, saw the note inviting more companies to make net zero commitments uh, by November this year, I believe. And uh, this is something that we have had internal discussions for quite some time now. Uh, the key to becoming a you know, net, uh, net zero is to first figure out exactly how much carbon is involved. So you know, I, think that, I think that having some sort of standards, particularly by perhaps the auditors, just like you know, the, the general accounting principles, could be something that's very useful because uh, then we are talking about the same thing. Uh, so, so for us as companies, you know, I, I think, I think uh, we are very welcoming of this. Uh, clearly, it's going to be a very significant endeavor by anyone who takes up this, this mantle, but, uh, you know, very welcoming and I think it's a great idea. Okay, um, Bilikas, the question I'm going to put to you about uh, partners in developing and emerging economies who don't see circular recycling uh, as their strategic agenda yet. Do you think that there'll be pushback from organisations or countries in that area that haven't really realised the potential of the circular economy? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's happening now. Um, people are waking up to see that it's circular economy is important. And so they are asking and requiring um, companies to be more responsible. Um, I think I'm encouraged, um, you know, by initiatives uh, that are coming up. Um, I just um, heard that the World Economic Forum is um, announcing one today in Nigeria um, on um, the Global Plastic Action Partnership. So I think that kind of, those kind of initiatives will ensure that it's a, it, will be, it will provide a platform um, for companies to, um, you know, because I think one of the major um, issues is that there is no accountability. Um, they, and also many of these um, companies may not have the resources or the knowledge um, to do what is required of them. So I think having this kind of platform where they know and they have, you know, steps, easy steps that they can follow is, is, um, is great. Um, we've also um, launched a, an NGO called the Fair Plastic Alliance that is focused on strengthening the value chain and making it more circular. So I think those kinds of, of initiatives will definitely help. 
Okay, Bilikas, thank you. Bertrand Clamou, a quick question for you, if you don't mind. This is from uh, uh, the idea of a new company and the issue of supply chain. Are there early steps that new companies can take to make sure they're doing the most in terms of the circular economy? Oh, definitely. Uh, I think that, too, and it's uh, very often the case with uh, uh, complex systems, uh, it's much more difficult to restructure and, uh, and, and reset or re-engineer processes than uh, starting right, right, right from, uh, from the beginning. And uh, for that, I mean, companies like ours are, are, are used to, to partner with, uh, with corporations to uh, uh, work with them from the beginning with the right setup, at least with the technologies we master today. Uh, hopefully it will, it will also change in the future, but to start with uh, really the latest technologies, the latest way of uh, engineering uh, processes uh, uh, so that uh, they can be uh, ready uh, to have that included in the way they, they operate. For example, we have partnership with uh, car manufacturers uh, worldwide, also Airbus, uh, to work with them on how they produce the planes and how can we facilitate dismantling and recycling. So uh, I think that we... The, 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 the sooner it is put in place in the, the setup of a company, the, the, the better it is, definitely. Okay, Bertrand, thank you for that. That brings us to the end of part one.